they don't understand photos so what I do with photos doesn't mean anything to them um, it's their families that are at risk of you know if somebody laughs at them because they've seen a picture of them that ridicule that's a risk faced by the families and the families do understand pictures and gave informed consent and also there's a reward to sharing images um, the, the, I had messages from the families that um, they were really proud to see their daughters in association with this work they were really happy to see people understand their daughters and they won a, an award and and that brought a lot of joy as well so it's a balance of risk and rewards and those at risk or those who understand the risk were the ones who gave consent question is often viewed in a binary, either yes it's okay to share images of people who can't give consent or no it's not and I have never found it to be such a simple question. I cannot sit here and say I've done the right thing or I've done the wrong thing but I can say that I have acted ethically. Um, and by that I mean that I have considered things deeply before acting and I have sought to do the right thing as far as my understanding, as far as was possible, all of those things. And so when thinking about this question, when thinking about whether it was right to share images of people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities online, when they're not able to expressly give their consent for that. I considered five things. I considered whether a position of certainty is possible. The idea that there is a right or a wrong answer to this suggests a one-size-fits-all. Um, and I think when you have that, you are losing reflectivity and returning to dogma. These, and I appreciate that systems that govern us as researchers may need to put particular stipulations in place to guide us. But I don't think that in the doing of these things, there is one answer that suits everybody. So I think each situation should be reflected on and considered in its own right. And it should be a difficult question every time. And I think certainty with regards to how you answer that question and with regards to whether there can be an answer to that question is, is tricky. So my first thing was certainty. My second thing that I considered is that there is an assumption that hiding people is automatically protective and I don't think that's the case. And I made that argument in my PMLD link paper, share their faces, say their names, um, because the, the obvious risk of sharing an image of a person with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities online is that that image would get mocked or misused in some way that would be hurtful and, and detrimental to that person and their families. And that is a very real risk. I am someone who occupies social media and I am very acutely aware of what an awful place it can be. So that I have shared images is in no way me saying that that risk doesn't exist. It absolutely does. Um, but the argument that I made in the PMLD link paper is that it is much the same as in days gone by when we hid disabled people away. The fear of ridicule doesn't change until people are brave enough to go out and confront the ridicule. And actually people act like that in response to things they don't understand and find frightening. And so I have tried always when I post online about people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities to do so in a way that is informative and I hope and positive 
and I hope that that nudges at the ignorance that creates the prejudice that is the threat. And in that regard, I would say that sharing the pictures online supports that community, but it supports the whole community. And I'm aware that I am sharing pictures of particular people. It's those people that are at risk. The community is less at risk in order to promote a community benefit that might not be especially reaped by those people. So that was a consideration. I also considered um, the idea that um, they are automatically incapable of giving consent. I think in the picture situation, it may well be the case that the people that I worked with were not capable of understanding what a photograph is, of understanding that it is a picture of them, of even recognising their own image when it's reflected back at them. Um, but I wouldn't automatically assume that of everybody who has the label profound multiple learning disabilities or profound intellectual multiple disabilities. So I think that those rules that say it is wrong to share people to, to share photos of people with profound intellectual are not considering the people within that, that they are all different. It sounds so trite to be sat saying people are all different, but they are so often clumped together as one whole that they're not considered as individuals. It's why often in my work I have written individuals with profound and multiple learning disabilities or profound intellectual multiple disabilities because you want to stress that yes this is a demographic but it is a demographic made up of individuals and so I don't think that they automatically lack capacity simply through having acquired the moniker of profound intellectual and multiple disabilities. However, in my case, I, I do feel that the young women that I worked with didn't understand the significance of the photo or what its meaning would be in the online space. They have no conception of the online world and that that is a place where they are viewed by other people. Um, so then my fourth point of consideration is where the meaning of those images lies. And I remember my colleague, um, Catherine de Haag, when I asked her if I could share a photo of her daughter, Johanna, on one of my training days. I have the most gorgeous image of Johanna and my sister lying in some coloured shreddings. She said, Johanna wouldn't care. Johanna wouldn't know. It makes no difference to Johanna. Yes, you can share the image. Um, and her point was that the meaning of that image doesn't exist, didn't exist in Johanna's world. And I think that's the case with the people that I worked with. However, the meaning does exist in my world, in your world, in the world of their parents and their siblings. And so the consequence of that meaning being shared isn't a question for them necessarily. The risk that people are being exposed to is associated with the meaning. And so the people who were at risk, the people who would suffer if the pictures that I have shared, and I really do feel the responsibility of that. I know it was me who clicked, you know, post on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all the places that I have shared those images. I, re I really feel the responsibility of that. But if and, you know, heaven forbid it ever happen. One of those pictures was to be picked up and mocked. It is their families that would suffer. And so I was very clear when I asked for consent from families. You'll see in the appendix of my thesis that they were given a consent form that described what I hoped to do and gave different options that I could um, work with their young person and not share any images at all or I could work with their young person and anonymize them but show show their picture or you know there was various permutations there so I think the people exposed to the risk were the people who were asked for consent and to make it a, a half a dozen things considered a lot of the talk around this sort of topic is about risk Rightly so, because we need to protect against risk. But we should also be mindful of reward. There have been over, it's something extraordinary number, like 9,000 views of the videos that I have 
posted about this work on YouTube alone. And I hope that every one of those views was informative for somebody, that cr created awareness of profound intellectual and multiple disability for someone. One of the tweets, so you'll also find this in the appendices of my thesis, one of the tweets that I shared, just a simple tweet about working with Becky, was retweeted over 20,000 times or was seen over 20,000 times and was held up by the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists as an example of good practice. So by sharing this stuff online, I hope I have created a positive change just a small one you know and yes of course I could have shared without pictures but if you know the online world then you know that without pictures you will get much less traction everybody well not everybody but many people learn better when there's an image associated with it and also when I was able to share the images I'm able to share meaning communicated by the people that I worked with as well as the meaning communicated by me so I can describe the picture but you might see something in it that I don't describe just through witnessing it. And I think there is an enormous power in the images and videos. And by sharing them, I think they have had a positive effect. And there's also been, and I know there's been a positive effect for the families because I've had emails from family members saying, we're so proud to see our daughter associated with this work. And we're so pleased to see people getting a better understanding of our daughter and who she is. We're like, they're so enjoying everybody celebrating their children because actually, although the online world has its very sinister corners, it also has a lot of really lovely people in it who will delight in this type of work and who have delighted and celebrated these families and these young people. And, <coughs> excuse me, the girls that I worked with were nominated for an award and they won. They won a place on the Leaders in Learning Disability and Autism Awards for advocacy, media and policy. And so that celebration of their participation and the public declaration that these are people who can, these are people whose existence is valid, these are people who are valuable, has had, you know, has been there. And so it is a balancing of risk and reward. And it is something that I have reflected deeply on. And I have done so in relation to each person that I worked with. And I don't think that there is an answer to whether sharing pictures of people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities without their consent, without them being able to give informed consent, is right or wrong. I think it should always be a difficult conversation and I don't feel any certainty in that I did the right thing. You know, I hope I did and I have thought about it and acted at every stage in a way I thought was right and I have no, it, it's not just been me doing that on my own <clears throat> I've been doing that in conversation with other people I've been taking in information from research information from families um, so I believe that I have acted ethically whether I did the right or the wrong thing is up for discussion mm -hmm.